In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Once Jesus was in a certain place praying, and when he had finished, one of his disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, Say this when you pray, Father, may your name be held holy, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sin. For we ourselves forgive each one who is in debt to us, and do not put us to the test. He also said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend and goes to him in the middle of the night to say, My friend, lend me three loaves, because a friend of mine on his travels has just arrived at my house, and I have nothing to offer him. And the man answers from inside the house, Do not bother me. The door is bolted now, and my children and I are in bed. I cannot get up to give it to you. I tell you, if the man does not get up and give it to him for friendship's sake, persistence will be enough to make him get up and give his friend all he wants. So I say to you, Ask, and it will be given to you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For the one who asks always receives. The one who searches always finds. The one who knocks will always have the door open to him. What father among you would hand his son a stone when he asked for bread, or hand him a snake instead of a fish? Or hand him a scorpion if he asks for an egg. If you then, who are evil, know how to give your children what is good, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Dear God's family, dear brothers and sisters, sensible people, soon come to the conclusion that human power is very much limited. Experience tells farmers, for instance, that however much they might labor, however much they sweat uh, into their cultivation, the cultivation of their fields, the harvest can easily go lost. Or, for all their money, wealthy persons realize that there are many things like health, peace, real happiness, and so on, which money cannot buy. Or, in spite of their knowledge and best efforts, doctors often feel powerless when faced with sickness. Or, history tells us that, for all their might, the powerful kingdoms like the Persians, the Babylonians, the Romans, the recent times British Empire, the Spanish Empire colonies, the French colonies, that were, they are no more there. They have all disappeared. Above all, everyone realizes that no amount of money, effort, wisdom or power can buy an extra hour of life for a person whose time to die has come. Aware of their weakness, people turn to God, to the one on whom everything depends, to the only one who can come to man's rescue when everything else fails. This, having recourse to God in time of need, is called prayer. Though this is not the whole of prayer, what one dimension of prayer is a prayer of petition and the prayer of intercession. There is, however, a great difference between the way a non-Christian approaches God in time of need and the way a Christian turns to Him. The non-Christian turns to God with respect, no doubt, but more often out of fear, fear in his heart. He is never sure how God will react to his petition, and therefore he is concerned of pleasing him through sacrifices. Again, the only purpose of his prayer is that God may grant his request to grant him some good or save him from some evil. A Christian instead, though equally aware of the need he stands of God, approaches God not with fear, but with a trust. His is the approach of a child to a father of whose love he is certain. 
For us Christians, to pray should mean to converse with our Father, who already knows our needs. Expressing our needs to God should be not only a way to acknowledge our weakness, but also a sign of our trust in Him, that we really trust in our Heavenly Father. Unfortunately, many Christians approach God in their prayer much as non-Christians do. Well aware of this and of the importance that prayer has in the life of a Christian, the church misses no opportunity to teach us how to pray and to help us to purify our prayers. So the church does it once again today and brings in no lesser teacher than Jesus himself with the help of the Gospel of Luke. St. Luke wrote his Gospel less than 40 years after Jesus had died. He wrote it for his Christians, many of whom had been pagans before. Among the various aims Luke had in mind when writing it was that of helping his Christians grasp the difference between their prayer as Christians and the one they had offered to God as pagans. The prayer of a Christian should resemble the prayer of Christ. The first lesson Luke wanted his Christians to learn was that Jesus had prayed and prayed often. In fact, his whole life had been a prayer. No other gospel presents Jesus' prayer at prayer as often as that of Luke. For instance, Luke says that Jesus was praying when the Spirit came upon him in the Jordan River. Luke chapter 3, verse 21 to 22. Jesus regularly withdrew to some lonely place to pray after a day of preaching and healing the sick. Luke chapter 5, verse 16. He spent the whole night in prayer before choosing the apostles. Luke chapter 6, verse 12. Jesus was at prayer before Peter confessed him as the Messiah. Luke chapter 9, verse 18. He was at prayer when his transfiguration took place on the mountain. Luke chapter 9, verse 29. Jesus assured Peter that he had prayed for him so that his faith in him might not collapse during his passion. Luke chapter 22, verse 32. Jesus prayed intensely at Gethsemane at the beginning of his passion. Luke chapter 22, verses 41 to 44. On the cross, Jesus prayed for those who had crucified him, and his last words on earth were nothing but a prayer of trust in his Father. He said, Father, into your hands I commend to my spirit. So, Jesus prayed as man. We pray to Jesus as God, and Jesus prays in us as our brother. So now we must ask, what was Jesus' prayer like? No one can give the answer to this question since no one can ever fathom the depth of love between Jesus and his Father. But we can be sure that oftener than not, we were the subject of Jesus' conversation with the Father in prayer. The best way for us to know what Jesus' prayer was like is to examine the prayer of our Father, the prayer he taught his apostles as we read in today's Gospel. There is no doubt that he taught them to pray the way he himself did. When listening to today's Gospel, you must have noticed that the Our Father, as given by Luke, does not exactly coincide with the one given by Matthew, the one we usually recite. Luke gives a shorter form, but the content of both is essentially the same. We should not be surprised at the difference. The early Christian communities used slightly different versions of the Our Father. Matthew and Luke give us the one their respective communities were using. The early Christians did not recite the Our Father in front of non-Christians as we do today. So deep was their respect for this prayer that they kept it secret from non-Christians and delayed teaching it to the catechumens until they were ready for baptism. 
out of reference for it too, its recitation was included in the celebration of the Eucharist as a preparation for Holy Communion. Let us now examine the content of this wonderful prayer. It starts, Father, Father, Luke does not add our Father or Father in heaven, as Matthew does. In the Old Testament, God was sometimes called Father, but no Jew ever thought of considering himself God's child as the way Christians did. This was the great secret that Jesus came to reveal, the real purpose of his coming, that God meant to make us all his children by sharing with us his own divine life. All that a person needs to become God's child is to believe in Jesus and be baptized. St. John says about Jesus right at the beginning of his gospel, He, to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. At his resurrection from the dead, Jesus hastened, hurried to communicate God's divine life to his apostles. At baptism, he communicates it to us, not just any life, but the very life by which he himself lives. St. John urges his Christians to ponder God's generosity in making them his children when he wrote, Think of the love that the Father has lavished on us by letting us to be called his children, and that is what we are. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. When Jesus invites us to call his Father our Father, he is not playing with words, but, but means to tell us, You now share my Father's life. He is now your Father no less than mine. You have truly become my younger brothers. Say, therefore, together with me, our Father, our Father. Next verse is, May your name be held holy. God is all holy, and his name is holy too. Jesus invites us to discover God's holiness, greatness, and power, and to praise him for all these. He invites us to express our gratitude to his Father for his many gifts which are nothing but expressions of his goodness. Mind you, God does not need our praise, nor does he gain anything from it. It is we who gain when we praise him, thus becoming ever better children of his, by longing that all men and women may revere him, our Father. Your kingdom come. God's kingdom differs totally from earthly kingdoms. Kings on earth derive benefit from their subjects, while in God's kingdom it is we who benefits from submitting to God's rule. By so doing, we are saved. And so the meaning of the words, your kingdom come, amounts to saying, Father, May all people hurry to put themselves under your loving rule so as to enable you to save them. Let them realize that only by doing your will will they attain true happiness. St. Luke does not add the next petition found in Matthew, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If we examine things well, its meaning is already included in the previous one, your kingdom come. Now let us look at the second part of the prayer, Our Father. Here Jesus rejoices that we join him in asking his Father that all men and women may become his loving children, that all may praise him and submit to his rule of love, and also that by doing his will all may be saved. But on reaching this point, Jesus invites us to proceed on our own, limiting himself to backing up our petitions, since he does not need material food, has no sins to be forgiven, <clears throat> runs no risk of falling into temptation or being harmed by anyone. In other words, in the second part of the prayer, Our Father, Jesus adapts his prayer to our needs. Give us this day our daily bread. Parents feed their children. There is no need for children to ask from them the food they need. Yet when a child says, Mommy, I am hungry, 
he expresses this dependence on her and is grateful for the food he receives. <clears throat> A similar feeling of trust is what God wants to instill into our hearts when adding the word daily to the word bread. He invites us to ask his father for the food we need for the day, as if saying, Father, I will need it also tomorrow, but will ask for it again, sure that in your love you will provide it for me. The book of Exodus narrates an incident which helps us to understand this petition. Each morning, God gave the manna to the Israelites in the desert, and they received it daily. The first time it fell, some people collected more than what they needed for the day. But whatever exceeded their need for the day got rotten, filled with worms. Exodus chapter 16, verse 19 to 21. This experience was meant to lead the Israelites to trust God for their food day after day. We must add a final consideration to this petition in the Our Father. When inviting us to ask his Father for our daily bread and daily food, Jesus wants us to include our spiritual food as well. We need it as much more uh, 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 than the material one, and only his Father can give it to us. The spiritual food par excellence is the Holy Eucharist, the food of his word <coughs> and the food of his sacraments, along with all the necessary actual graces that he would need, we would need throughout that day. Forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive. <coughs> Prayer acts like a mirror. It reflects both God's holiness and our own sinfulness. Who among us does not feel the need of being forgiven time and again? Or again, can anyone keep an account of how much God has forgiven him or her during life? Someone has called the Our Father a very dangerous prayer. Why? Not that God forgives us because we forgive or as we forgive. Our forgiveness can never be the measure to God's forgiveness. But he wants us to join him in forgiving, even if we forgive so little and so meanly. This is a key point in our Christian life. Nothing blocks so completely our relationship with God as refusal to forgive offenses received. Millions of sinners have been saved, but not one who refused forgiveness ever entered heaven. Ever entered heaven. One who forgives, for, uh, refuses forgiveness is never forgiven. Do not put us to the test. These words of Jesus reflect the way people spoke in his time. But the Apostle James hastens to tell us that God does not tempt anyone. James chapter 1 verse 30, 13. Only the devil tempts us, inviting us to commit sin. The request is a confession of one's own weakness based on past experience, and it amounts to asking, give us the strength to resist temptation when the devil tempts us. That is what God, Matthew means when he adds, save us from the evil one, Matthew chapter 6, verse 13. Nowadays we say, deliver us from evil, thus including in our petition all kinds of evil, both spiritual and material, keeping however in mind that the worst evil that can befall us is sin. It was a great act of kindness and love on the part of Jesus to teach us the prayer, Our Father. The whole gospel is summed up in this prayer. Jesus taught us how to pray, how to converse with God, Our Father. How to do it? With the trust, with the gratitude, with joy, just as he himself did. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. So we now pray, Father in heaven, we praise you for having sent your Son Jesus to teach us how to pray. Let the thought that we are your children, 
Lead us to turn to you at all times with joy and with confidence. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Living Jesus, living be my Jesus, viva living Jesus, Philopea. Living Jesus, living be my Jesus, viva living Jesus, Philopea. Oh, Philopea, lover of God, oh, bring to Mary, help of Christians. Philopea, lover of God, pray to Mary, help of Christians. Living Jesus, living, viva Jesus, viva living Jesus, Philopea. Living Jesus, living, viva Jesus, viva living Jesus.